Hey, <laughs> are we started? Yes. Um, so I, if I were there in person, uh, I would probably throw some smoke bomb fireworks and come out uh, on stage and, and try to match that, uh, that trailer for the class. But unfortunately, it's just going to be me on a, on a screen. Um, just Uh, just really quickly before we start the presentation, um, I've been asked to make a couple announcements. Uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the content or about space, about Shakespeare in general. Uh, please email questions to lifelong learning. That's one word, lifelong learning at wichita.edu. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, we're not monitoring the live chat, so I won't get questions there. But if you can email questions to Lifelong Learning, they'll be passed on to me, and I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, there's also apparently a, a microphone set up uh, for comments, questions, although, Tat, I, I don't have a visual of the audience. Um, but uh, I will save time for uh, people who are live. Yes, there we go. Uh, to ask questions. Please uh, stand on the X marked on the floor and do not touch the mic, and I'll see if I can help you. Uh, we will take about a 10-minute break, about 50 minutes into this, this talk, and I'll try to leave at least 10 minutes, possibly more, at the end of the session for questions, comments, or other discussion or whatnot. So uh, there we go. Let's, let's go on to our first uh, slide. Um, Thank you very much. My uh, back one, Tat. I'm sorry. Yes, well, we'll this will be a well-oiled machine by the end of week four. Um, I'm Dr. Francis Connor. I am a professor at Wichita State University in the English department, uh, and my specialty is uh, early modern literature, English Renaissance literature, particularly Shakespeare. Uh, I'm an editor on the New Oxford Shakespeare, where we're putting together an edition of Shakespeare's complete works. A couple of volumes of that appeared in 2018 and we're working on the next set. Uh, and a lot of my scholarship deals with Shakespeare and publication history. I'm interested in the people who made Shakespeare's books and how his texts circulated and things like that. Uh, this is the second time I'm, I'm doing this course. Last year for, I guess, Shakespeare One. Uh, we focused on Shakespeare's major genres, and we talked about a lot of his major plays, Hamlet, The Tempest, Henry V. Uh, this semester, I think we're going to dig a little bit into some Shakespearean subgenres. Uh, this week, um, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about his narrative poem, Venus and Adonis, which was Shakespeare's first enormous literary success. It's, 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 it's not a poem that's read an awful lot today, but it's, it's fun. I hope you'll find it's fun and very important to his career. Uh, next week, we're going to turn to Revenge Tragedy, and we'll look at uh, Titus Andronicus, another early work of Shakespeare, and one that's very strange and weird. Uh, for the week of September 22nd, we'll talk about Shakespeare's turn to uh, Roman plays, classical plays. We'll use Coriolanus as our model for that class. And on our, the final session on the 29th, I'm going to, uh, what I call political Shakespeare, I'm going to throw together two plays that deal with some pressing political issues of Shakespeare's time that may be relatable to ours. They'll be the comedy As You Like It, uh, and another very odd play, Timon of, of Athens. Uh, which, so, Hopefully this is interesting. 
Uh, I, I do apologize that I'm doing this course remotely this year. Uh, COVID-19 has disrupted all of our lives, and this is one of the ways it's it's been disruptive. Uh, but that that also gives us a good in into Shakespeare, and especially this part of Shakespeare's life and career that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so if I next slide, uh, we'll begin with a proper image of our our poet here. This is probably the most accurate rendering of William Shakespeare that we have uh, put together by his friends. This is part of the title page to the first folio published posthumously in 1623. It collected most of Shakespeare's dramatic work. Uh, the one thing I like to emphasize at the beginning of every Shakespeare class that I teach is that there are a lot of myths and weirdness about Shakespeare and who he was and things like that. And I, I want to uh, assure you that the William Shakespeare pictured here who wrote the plays was indeed the William Shakespeare here who wrote the plays. They were not secretly written by the Earl of Oxford, Christopher Marlowe, Queen Elizabeth, an anonymous group of men, uh, anything like that. Now we'll find out and we'll, we'll talk about this a couple times in the next few weeks. There was a lot of collaboration in the early modern drama. Shakespeare would work with other playwrights, but there was William Shakespeare from Stratford and he did write the works we're gonna be, be talking about. It is not a scholarly debate. Uh, and if you have questions about that, feel free to, to ask me. This is a subject close to my heart. Um, so I wanted to begin with a, a, a little biography of his, his early years to sort of set the tone for uh, Venus and Adonis and, and Titus next week. Um, so, but again, to, to tie it into kind of our current situation, uh, the next slide, please, Tat. Um, I said, we're, we're in the middle of a, uh, how can we call it, a health crisis. During Shakespeare's lifetime, there were a lot of periods where his life was disrupted by the plague. And once he became a playwright, uh, there were a few major outbreaks where the theaters would be closed. And I, I list a couple of them on, on this slide. Uh, I, I, oh, no, 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 not next slide yet. <laughs> back, 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 I'm sorry. Um, so I list a lot of them on, on this slide, right? The, the major one early in the 1590s that killed at least 11,000 dead in London. Uh, and then the 16 teens were, were full of, of plagues. And they didn't understand in Shakespeare's time what caused this. Uh, they, they kind of, you know, they saw a lot of rats around, so they figure it was the rats that caused the plague. It's not quite right. It was probably the fleas on rats that, that spread it. Uh, but one thing they did know was that crowds were bad. Crowds spread plague. So when there was a plague outbreak, uh, the theaters were closed. And when the theaters were closed, People like Shakespeare, who wanted to create a literary career for themselves, had to figure out a way to make a living. And there were a, a couple of ways to do that. Uh, one would be to travel, to, take a, to join a theater company and go to other parts of England where hopefully the plague hadn't reached uh, and, and suit your wares there. Uh, the other would be to write some things that aren't play, plays write some non-dramatic work and use that as a way to sustain your life and your career and some other things. And this will be the choice that, that Shakespeare made. Uh, the, the image there is actually a picture of a, a medical book. Uh, at this time, a lot of medical knowledge was still based on uh, ancient writings of Galen and Greek writers. Uh, there wasn't yet anything approaching you know, the scientific method. Uh, or whatnot. The, the microscope is only invented about 1590. So they know people are dying from plague and it's incredibly per pervasive. There are daily lists posted of how many people in each county are dying of plagues and names of dead and things like that. So this is very much a part of, of Shakespeare's life. Um, and now, uh, next slide, please. I'm reminded of this. this. This is a tweet that went viral 
uh, in March, when we are just beginning to deal with our, our COVID-19 stuff. It's, it's from the country singer Roseanne Cash. And she, she writes that, uh, just a reminder that when Shakespeare was quarantined because of the plague, he wrote King Lear. Uh, and this is meant to be a lighthearted kind of inspirational tweet, right? Just because we might be locked inside for a couple of months doesn't mean we can, you know, need to waste our time. Uh, you too can write King Lear. It's it's very aspirational. Uh, but I think the, the, the thing with this tweet is that it really does underestimate how uh, pervasive the plague was. We, we really aren't quite sure what play Shakespeare might have written during times the theaters were closed because they were closed so frequently. It was a constant background for, for Shakespeare's work. Uh, and that's something I want to, I'm, I'm not going to, make this a big thematic thread or anything like that. But it's something I want to keep in mind. And it's interesting when you read Shakespeare's works with this perspective, uh, that he is, he is writing in a culture that is always dealing with this disease that they don't know how to handle. When you think about things like the, the famous bit in uh, Romeo and Juliet, right? A plague on both your houses, which Mercutio says, uh, after he dies because Romeo, being a clumsy fool, uh, tries to intervene in a fight and, and Mercutio gets stabbed. A plague on both your houses is actually really a curse. It's not It's not just a, a, a lament. It's really, I hope you Montagues and Capulets get the plague, uh, which was a real threat at this time. So this is a, a, a very important context for Shakespeare's work. And as we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, an immediate context for Venus and Adonis, the, the first play we're going to write about. So I want to go in the history of, I want to give a little bit of Shakespearean biography before we look at his work. Uh, and I'll start with just his career in the 1590s on the next slide. Uh, and we'll work a little bit backwards. But, uh, the, the 1590s was a big time for Shakespeare. It was a big time for English literature in general. This was the decade where we see the beginning, where we see Christopher Marlowe and John Donne and Ben Jonson, uh, and a lot of the authors that we see as the, uh, the important members of the literary canon really writing their first works. Uh, so Shakespeare, 1594, after a couple of years, and I'll talk about his early years in, in a minute, uh, when the theaters reopened, not long after that, in 1594, he co-founds the Lord Chamberlain's Men. He's one of eight shareholders. He will be their playwright. He's also an actor. Uh, this ultimately assured him some financial security because whether or not uh, the Lord Chamberlain's Men staged a play, uh, Shakespeare play, they would stage plays from other playwrights, but Shakespeare got paid. This was an, an early like, limited liability corporation or something like this. And uh, this would allow Shakespeare the time and security to write a lot of his, his works. That same year, they make their first performance at, at Whitehall with Queen Elizabeth. Uh, next week with Time of Athens, I'll talk a little bit about how performances work, the public theaters versus the private theaters uh, versus the court. But being invited to the court to play for the queen uh, was a big deal. The queen does not go to public theaters to see plays. She brings the playwright to her. And the Lord Chamberlain's men, later the king's men, would be very popular with uh, the Queen Elizabeth and later King James I. Uh, as a sign of how well Shakespeare does, 1597, he buys the new place in Stratford. That is the second biggest house in Stratford. Only the church rectory was a bigger residence. Uh, so it shows that at a fairly early stage in his career, 1597 is before Hamlet, Othello, uh, a lot of the plays we, we know Shakespeare for, uh, his, his theater group is always doing, is already doing pretty well. Um, Shakespeare, for whatever reason, always aspired to be a gentleman. Uh, it's, it's, and 1599, he puts in an application for a coat of arms for his family, which is earned. Uh, this is something Shakespeare will be ridiculed a lot for by uh, uh, other playwrights will ridicule him for. It's kind of a sign of his uh, amb ambition. 
uh, even though he's a great playwright, he does, I think, want to make a name for himself and want to uh, make a hefty pile of money, which is fine. With the Lord Chamberlain's men taking, taking off in 1599, they built the Globe Theater, which is pictured here and which I'll show you. This is the most famous place where Shakespeare's plays were staged. Before that, they're staging them at another of other, a number of other playhouses in London. 1599, they have their own exclusive place and they absolutely take off. Uh, two things we'll talk about a little later, but just to, to foreshadow here, uh, in 1599, one genre that was considered, considered a bit troublesome at the time were history plays, especially English history plays. For the most part, the authorities of London didn't care what playwrights, uh, what theater companies performed, uh, although there was a bit of a censorship regime, and that's, that's something we'll get to later. But history plays, uh, especially some of the you know, things like Henry V, which are less patriotic than one might think, that are a bit cynical about power and rule. Uh, they started to upset some authorities and new history plays were banned. And this is where Shakespeare moves from writing things like Henry V to writing things like Julius Caesar and Coriolanus. So it's a political change that uh, affects Shakespeare's style. In 1601, he gets wrapped up in a political intrigue plot of his own. The Earl of Essex uh, plans, puts together a plot to dethrone Queen Elizabeth. Because by 1601, Queen Elizabeth was very old, uh, very sick. She wasn't in the public eye anymore. And since she had no children, there was a lot of anxiety about who to replace her. Earl of Essex had a claim to the throne. He figured, why don't I do it myself? I have popular support. Uh, so they were going to overthrow her. Being a theatrical sort, he announced his plot by hiring the Lord Chamberlain's men to do a, a production of Richard II, a play which features the weak, feckless Richard II being deposed from the English throne. And after that, the Earl was, I'm, I'm taking over the throne now. But he failed and, and was executed. Uh, but the Lord Chamberlain's men were taken, and including Shakespeare, were taken in for questioning. It was decided that they had no knowledge of Essex plots, and that's uh, very much the case. That, that does indeed seem to be the case, uh, but it's a, it's a brush with the London authorities that is significant in, in Shakespeare's life. So just this part of the decade, we see him going from starting a play company to at the end uh, being, being heavily involved uh, with productions for the English court to the extent that they are drawn in as a, uh, the announcement of a rebellion. Uh, so this is the popular Shakespeare of the 1590s, the decade where he becomes big. And now I'm gonna move backward and talk a little bit about his, his early life, uh, starting with the next slide. So what we know about Shakespeare, and we do know a lot, he's born in Stratford, about April 1564, Stratford, north of London. It's a town that a lot of people uh, would, would pass through. It was, it was kind of like a, a famous rest stop town. If you were going to Oxford or Cambridge or north, uh, you, you might stop in, in Stratford. Uh, born in April 1564, we know he's baptized on April 26th, 1564. Uh, because of this, uh, it takes a few days to schedule a baptism after you're born. So you'll often see a birth date for Shakespeare of April 23rd. That in part, that's because, and we'll get to this a lot later, but he dies in, on April 23rd, 1616. So uh, if he's being born and dying on the same day has an interesting symmetry, but uh, that, that birth date maybe requires a little massaging and may not be completely true, but hey. 
print the legend. He's born in 1564. Uh, his father makes gloves for a living. And he also seemed to have a side project in poaching deer and selling venison illegally, which gets him into a mild amount of trouble. Uh, his mother is Mary Arden. The Ardens were a fairly prominent family around Warwickshire, Stratford, around that time. So he wasn't, didn't grow up wealthy, but comfortably. Uh, Shakespeare would not go to university. He didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. This is one of the things that some people have a difficult time believing. But in the six, in 16th century England, uh, universities were essentially vocational schools. So you went there if you were going to be a lawyer or clergy or, or something like that. Uh, we, Shakespeare probably had certainly had a very good education at what we call a, a free school, in his case, uh, the King's New School. And free schools were institutions put together by local landowners, local freemen, local business people, who would pull their money together and found schools for their, their children. So a very early iteration of public schools. And the curriculum of these free schools was almost entirely Latin. You read Latin history, you read Latin poetry, you read Latin, whatever their equivalence of, of science was. So Shakespeare would have had a incredibly strong background in Latin literature and the classics is filtered through Latin. Nobody reads Greek in this, in this period. So even though Shakespeare didn't go to university, his education at King's New School would have better prepared him for being a playwright than at university where he probably just would have read uh, medieval theological tracts and things like that. So um, we don't actually have records of any of the, the free schools, but there, there's, it seems very likely that he went there. Um, so he marries 1582, a local lady named Anne Hathaway. They have their first child, Susanna, in 1583. Now you can do a little bit of math with the dates here. They, she marries Anne Hathaway in November 1582. Susanna is born 1583. That's, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, about seven months. So I think we have there possibly the reason why Shakespeare married Anne Hathaway. Uh, they would later have twins, uh, Judith and Hamnet in 1585. Uh, and after that, no other children. Having, having twins at the time was probably a, uh, very difficult for the woman, we'll just say. Uh, and those are his, his children. Hamnet would die uh, about a decade later. Um, I don't know that he died of the plague, but again, it's uh, one of the things you uh, recognize when you look at histories of the period is that there are a lot of random and young deaths. So that's the pervasiveness of the plague again. So how did this guy essentially from the countryside of England become a playwright? Uh, the thinking is he probably got together with a traveling theater. Um, being a rest stop town, Stratford was a city that a lot of theater groups would go through. And it seems quite likely that that's where Shakespeare picked up a, a love for theater and went back to London with one of these groups. There is a legend, and this is in one of in the most credible of the early biographies of Shakespeare by a guy named Nicholas Rao. Uh, he may have uh, worked as a school teacher for a little while, which, considering how much he makes fun of school teachers in his plays, seems quite plausible to me. But he probably joined one of these traveling groups and goes to to London. Uh, by the late 1580s, he seems to be collaborating on plays in London. His earliest play is probably uh, to, uh, to, Two Gentlemen of Verona, uh, which we date to 1589. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, this is a title page of a play called, uh, briefly called, Arden of Faversham, uh, the lamentable and ter true tragedy of Arden of Faversham. Uh, it's essentially a true crime play. It's a history play about one Alice Arden who uh, is having an affair with another man and they decide to kill her husband. It actually happened in Arden, which is not far from where Shakespeare lived. It was a national scandal. It made the history books. 
Uh, this text is significant. This is published 1592. This is the first play that Shakespeare had a hand in writing that was published. Uh, his early work is, is mostly collaborative, and we'll talk about this next week. Um, but this is where he's starting to emerge as, as an author. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, we'll go, we'll go to the next slide. So the commercial theater only starts in the 1590s. Before that, there is you know, the first theater in London starts at about 1576. And um, you know, there, there are theaters popping up here and there in the 1580s, but the 1590s is really when the theater business as we kind of know it begins to emerge. Uh, Shakespeare by 1592 was starting to make a name for himself as a playwright. And we have evidence of this from this passage in a book called uh, Green's Groat's Worth of Wit. And Green is Robert Green, who is the uh, person in the death shroud there. This is purportedly his posthumous thoughts. Green dies in, in 1592, perhaps of the play. Uh, he was a playwright. He was university educated. And uh, with uh, some other university educated playwrights, they kind of, uh, they showed some disdain for Shakespeare, the country boy going to London to write plays. And he writes this uh, from Green's Growth with a Wit, uh, or actually Robert Green doesn't write this, somebody else writes it in his voice. But uh, he says, there's an upstart crow beautified with our feathers that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, supposes he is as well able to bombat out a blank verse as the best of you. And being an absolute Johannes factotum, jack of all trades, in his own conceit, the only Shakespeare in a country. Shakespeare gives you a clue about who he's writing about, right? Shakespeare, Shakespeare, ha 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 ha. Uh, and if you don't get that subtlety, the line with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide is taken from a play that Shakespeare helped write, uh, Henry the Sixth, Part Two. Uh, I believe, where it's, uh, it's his tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide, but now it's a tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide, an actor's hide, like Shakespeare. So Shakespeare here is being accused of putting on beautiful feathers to fake being uh, the sort of playwright that Robert Greene is. In other words, this Shakespeare kid is stealing our thunder. So First mention we have of Shakespeare, and it's not very flattering, uh, but it seems to be uh, a bit of jealousy. And it should be noted that playwrights like Green, the plays they were writing tended to be more rigidly classical, a lot of long speeches, not a lot of action on stage, kind of boring. And Shakespeare's among the first playwrights who is trying to change that by including more dialogue, more action, more comedy, mixing genres and things like that. Um, so that takes us to the year that he's going to write Venus and Adonis and on the next slide. So late 1592 is that major breakout of the play that closes the theaters. It'll close the theaters for more than a year. Just when Shakespeare's theatrical career is taking off. So what is he going to do? Well, he decides, if I can't make a career at this literature thing as a playwright right now, I'm going to write a poem and try to do it that way. And that's what a lot of writers would do. Now, uh, to make a living as a, as a published author in this period was difficult. There was no royalty system. Uh, so you didn't get paid for every copy of the book sold. You got paid once, maybe, when you sold your book to a manuscript. You would write something like this to show that you could be a great writer, and that would be your calling card to get a job, maybe as the secretary for uh, a nobleman or working in town government or something like that. And that's one of the reasons, 
not entirely the reason, right? He's an artist, so he wants to create things as well. Uh, but it also might help his career by showing, hey, I'm William Shakespeare, I can write cool things, pay me regularly until the theater is open again. So he decides to write Venus and Adonis, and he calls this in that introduction on the right-hand side, he calls this the first heir of my invention, the, essentially the first work he's going to take public credit for. Uh, Venus and Adonis as a poet is based on the works of the Latin poet Ovid, based on a story from his Metamorphoses, which is a series of stories about humans changing into uh, other bodies, animals and flowers and things like that. Uh, so on the, the, the right-hand side, or uh, I guess on the right-hand side, that dedication to the right honorable Henry Rothley, uh, this is what you would see in a lot of printed books at this time, a patronage plea. Here he decides to dedicate this to Henry Rossley, the Earl of Southampton. Uh, he dedicates this poem to him. He promises some graver later, la graver labor, and his next work would be a tragic poem, uh, Lucrece. This is a comic poem. Uh, Henry Rossley, Earl of Southampton, he's one of those guys in Shakespeare's orbit where there's a lot of mythology. Rothley Southampton was a very foppish young man. Uh, there are portraits of him where he looks very womanly. In fact, there was one portrait that for a long time people thought was of a woman, but has recently been discovered to be of the Earl of Southampton. So there's a lot of ideas that, oh, he's the guy Shakespeare's writing about in the sonnets, or he was Shakespeare's secret love, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's uh, that's fun fan fiction, but there's really no evidence that, frankly, that they ever met, uh, much less had a, a relationship. Uh, this sort of dedication letter is actually very conventional. It is the sort of thing an author would write to a powerful person when they were hoping to be in their employ. The most important thing here, though, at the the bottom of that, uh, your your honors in all um, uh, that. The very bottom, uh, William Shakespeare. This is the first time we see Shakespeare's name in print, and he takes authorship for this work. So the first thing, your honor is in all duty. That's what it is. Your honor is in all duty, William Shakespeare. Uh, this is the first time we see Shakespeare's name in print. The first time he is publicly taking credit for, an, for a work of art is the place he had worked on before he had done without credit anonymously. And so this would be the work he is first known for. So Shakespeare is first known as a poet rather than a playwright. Um, to go to the, the other side of that, the title page, the one that says Venus and Adonis, uh, the, the big ornament on that is the ornament of the person who printed the book, Richard Field. Field was also from Stratford. And in fact, his family's house was only a couple of blocks away from Shakespeare's house. So, and I think Shakespeare's father had some dealings with the Fields family. So Shakespeare and Richard Field may have known each other. And uh, you know, who, who knows if that had anything to do with Field publishing this. Um, Richard Field, I'll show an example of this in a second, but Richard Field would become one of the most uh, important printers in, in England, and he's publishing this book. Uh, it's going to be sold, the bookseller, these are to be sold in the sign of the White Greyhound in Paul's Churchyard. Uh, the White Greyhound would be the sign in front of the bookshop where you can buy this, and it was owned by a person named John Harrison. Harrison is known at the time as uh, a bookseller interested in publishing Ovidian-related books. He published the complete works of, of Ovid in English and Latin. And since this is a poem based on Ovid, uh, he would very much be interested in this. And Ovid was a very popular author at this period. You'll see between the, the title, Venus and Adonis, and that ornament, uh, there is a little Latin phrase that translates to uh, let base conceited wits admire vile things. Fair Phoebus lead me to the muses springs. And it's, it's a quote from Ovid uh, that essentially claims let other authors will write about simple base things. I'm going to be inspired by the muses. 
So it's a claim that this is not just a, a stupid comic erotic poem, but it is a work of literature. Um, but I assure you it is also kind of a stupid erotic comic poem. Uh, so uh, that inscription on the title page is sometimes taken as Shakespeare's statement of his literary ambition, but it was probably put there by uh, the bookseller without Shakespeare's uh, acquiescence or anything else. So this is what Venus and Adonis looks like. And uh, if we go to the next slide and look at the inside of this book, uh, we know I, I can go on forever on how influential Shakespeare is as a writer, how he influenced the language, how a lot of our story tropes and things like that come from Shakespeare. But he's also being involved with this. He's involved with a very influential book. And this is where the printer Richard Field becomes prominent in Shakespeare's story. Uh, this is a very elegantly designed book for the 1590s. It uses Roman type, so it's very easy to read. Uh, there's uh, generous spacing, so the words aren't cramped together. There's space between stanzas, so you can tell them easily apart. There's a symmetry to the book, so it, it looks pleasing. And he doesn't, he never breaks a page. He never includes a page break where it'll interrupt the stanza. So you get four stanzas on every page. Uh, except the, the first, but then he uses an ornament to fill space. So this is a beautiful looking book. Uh, for comparison's sake, can we go to the, the next slide? This is something published around the same time by uh, Thomas Lodge, and it's also a poem based on Ovid. Uh, so it's mining the same genre that Shakespeare is, but it's printed in black letter type, which is harder to read. Uh, it's everything is pushed together, so it's kind of inelegant. There's some symmetry, but it's not sustained. And it, it really it's it's crowded. The spacing isn't great. It it really looks like two big black marks on on the page. Uh, it, it's not particularly attractive, or it's certainly not attractive, I think, as the Venus and Adonis books. And this is how a, a, most poetry books before 1590 looked. They used black letter. They were spaced horribly, often crooked, often inconsistent. Uh, but Richard Field makes Shakespeare's poem look elegant. And we can go to the, the, the next slide. Um, and this is what poetry books would look like from the 1590s on. Um, in addition to the, this groundbreaking design, there are only, I think by, by my count, I think there are maybe five errors in this text, uh, which for a 1,200-line poem set by hand in 1593 is really impressive. And Field also takes some steps to standardize spelling and to standardize punctuation. There really aren't you know, proper spelling rules, proper punctuation rules in Shakespeare's time. So that's another way Field is evading. So a, a much easier and much more elegant book compared to uh, compared to the Lodge book that I showed you. And we can go to the, the next slide, which is just a, an image of uh, it's an example of the, the title page of the works of Ovid, uh, translated by Arthur Golding. Uh, again, Ovid was a really popular author in England. The Golding translation is really important because it's the one that Shakespeare used. Uh, it's also one that the, his printer Richard Field probably worked on. He was an apprentice for Robert Walgrave, who actually wrote this. Um, so we can go to the, the next slide. So. So what we have with Venus and Adonis, it's a it's a attractive looking book. It's based on the works of Ovid, who is incredibly popular. Uh, and it's sold by a bookseller specializing in Ovidian work. So it's really no surprise. This was a smash hit. This is reprinted more than any other poetry book before 1650. And it's reprinted more than any other Shakespeare work, whether play, poem, or, or otherwise. Uh, 
it, this, so Shakespeare initially makes his reputation publicly, not as a playwright, but as a writer of Ovidian poetry. And as further evidence of how popular this book was, this is an image of the title page uh, from the copy in the Bodleian, from the first edition. And it is the only copy of the first edition that we have, which suggests that since most editions were published in uh, about 1500 at a time, which suggests that this edition was literally read to death, read to pieces. This is the only copy we have out of a 1500 book run. But draw your attention to the, on the kind of the, the left-hand side of this title page, you'll see uh, some writing there in pen above that, that bodily and stamp that bleh, um, uh, there's some handwriting there. It's the signature of the owner of the book, which is a woman named Frances Wolferston. It's, it reads Frances Wolferston, her book. And she was a collector of books in early modern England. And she owned this copy of Venus and Adonis and claimed it as hers. And uh, next slide, please. And not only did she did that, she was a very attentive reader to it because she actually found uh, a couple of the potential errors in Venus and Adonis. And it, it may not come up too well on this screen, but that opening line, the sun that shines from heaven shine, shines but warm. She crosses out the A-S and puts T-H above it. So it reads shineth. Uh, and the, the last line in that stanza that points to between this heavenly and earthly sun, she makes it between this heavenly and this earthly sun, she, she adds a word. Uh, the, the problem here is the meter. Uh, heaven is actually, for the most part in Shakespeare, pr pronounced as one syllable, as heaven. Uh, same with even, even is in. Uh, so to make the, the meter work properly, she feels they need to make these metrical annotations to it. So Wolferson isn't just reading this book passively. She's getting in there with her pen and finding things that she thinks are a problem and, and amending them. A, a good example of the, uh, the idea of the author as the kind of editor of their books. And uh, next, next slide, please. I'll pass this kind of quickly, just to, for some context in early modern reading, right, this is the book called England's Parnassus. It is a printed commonplace book. Uh, the way people would often read, including Shakespeare, is when they read a text, they would mark off passages that they really liked. They would often go back, open up a blank journal, take the passages from their reading, copy them in the journal. And then sometimes they would take those journals, those commonplace journals, and have them published. And that's what English, England's Parnassus does. Uh, this book is, uh, this book contains a lot of examples uh, from Shakespeare's works, including Venus and Adonis and Lucrece and a couple of uh, early plays of his. Um, can we go to the, the next slide? And just another example, this, this book is a particularly interesting one because printed books at this time were not, you did not buy them bound. You had to get them bound yourself. So what some people would do was they would bind blank pages into their book. And with these blank pages, they would add, uh, as, as they do here, their own poetry and, and kind of dialogue with their and extend the commonplace books that they own. So reading is a very active activity in Shakespeare's time. And readers would often copy their favorite passages into books and elsewhere. And where we're going with this is further evidence of Venus and Adonis' popularity is the extent to which it is copied in other books. And we'll, we'll go to the, the next slide, please. So this, the handwriting I'm focusing on, this is someone who copied a passage of Venus and Adonis in, in a book, right? Fair flower, and I transcribed it there. Fair flowers that are not gathered in their prime, rot and consume themselves in little time. Um, from Venus and, and Adonis. This book is a 13th century Latin theological text, which really makes me wonder, how does a passage from Venus and Adonis, which is for the most part 180 degrees from a theological text, what makes someone decide, I like this passage of Venus and Adonis, 
But I'm reading this book of Latin sermons. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to copy a famous passage in the margin. I have I have no idea the story behind that, but it it, it, it certainly says something. Someone I think somebody must have been really bored reading this uh, and decided to spruce it up a, a little bit. But it shows how right some someone at a at a at an abbey uh, had access to Venus and Adonis and copied it in their in their theological books. Um, next slide, please. This is a more conventional commonplace book uh, owned by a gentleman named Henry Colling, not long after Venus and Adonis was published. We're gonna focus on these lines later, but I'll, I'll just say for now, uh, this is essentially the dirtiest part of Venus and Adonis. And maybe not surprisingly, it's the part of Venus and Adonis that's copied most frequently. This, this is found in like six different manuscripts. Uh, so this is, uh, um, I'll read the passage a little later because it's one that I, I have on my, my book, uh, which, which goes to show you again, even in Shakespeare's time, the, the texts that a lot of people are interested in are you know, not necessarily the great philosophical uh, dis discussions or debates or monologues in Shakespeare, but the, uh, the bits where a, a woman offers to be a field to a gentleman's deer, as it is here. Uh, and the, the next slide, please. And this is, this is another example. Uh, I believe this, this is written, this is in the Folger Shakespeare Library in, in Washington, D.C., uh, I believe this is a uh, a excerpt from Venus and Adonis that's been um, the author made some changes to it. It's written, I believe, on the back of a letter. So again, it seems to be another case where someone had a copy of Venus and Adonis, wanted to remember a couple of great lines from it, and they they just copied this in in general. So for this part, and I'll. I'll coming up on 10 of, so I'll send it to, to break and maybe leave a message, uh, a moment if people have questions. Uh, to sum up, so Venus and Adonis is a poem that was written when the theaters were closed during a time of plague. It's how Shakespeare jump-started his theatrical reputation, his literary reputation. It was an incredibly popular play. <sighs> popular play. I, Shakespeare wrote poetry too. It's an incredibly popular poem. It was popular for the first half through the first half of the 17th century. People copied it, people bought it, it was frequently printed, quoted. Uh, there were lots of literary allusions to Venus and Adonis. And because it was so popular, it made Shakespeare's reputation early on. So even before he's famous as a playwright, he's famous as a, a poet. So for the second part of our talk today, I'm going to turn to the poem itself and read and talk about a couple of excerpts from it and think about what is this poem actually about? Why are people so attracted to it? Uh, well, fundamentally, it deals with one of Shakespeare's favorite subjects, which, which is love. And it's one of those works that focuses on the ways people, when they're in love, act stupidly. Uh, so... Um, I'm going to uh, pause here. We can take our, our 10 minute break. And when I return, we'll start by looking in the, the text itself of Venus and Adonis. And I can hang on for a minute if anyone has questions or anything to say. So but thank you.
<clears throat> All right. How is everybody? All right, next, next slide, please. So we've uh, talked about how important this poem was to literary history, to Shakespeare's career. Uh, let's read a bit of the poem itself and see what its, its contents have to offer, see what the young author Shakespeare was interested in. So these are the very first lines of, of Venus and Adonis. So I'll read the, the first stanza. In as the sun, with purple-colored face, had tamed its last leave of the weeping morn. Rose-cheeked Adonis, hide him to the chase. Hunting he loved, but love he laughed to scorn. Sick-thoughted Venus makes a mane unto him, and like a bold-faced suitor, gins to woo him. So right off the bat, we have the central tension and the plot for most of this, this poem. Uh, Adonis is riding in the fields. He is rose-cheeked, which means he is young and innocent, and he likes to hunt. Hunting he loves, but being young and innocent, he's not interested in love. He scorns love. He prefers to laugh at people in love so he can hunt. Venus is sick-thoughted Venus, and sick here is lovesick, which is, you know, the goddess Venus, the goddess of love. No, no surprise. Uh, and she looks at him and like a bold-faced suitor, like a suitor, tries to woo him. So she sees this lovely man traveling the countryside, hunting, and she figures, I'm, I'm going to get me some of that. Now... The setting of this poem, uh, the sun with the purple colored face had taken its last leave of the weeping morn. The morning is ending, so this poem starts at noon. So it starts at the time when uh, it's during the summer, so it's especially hot out. But I think it's a bit of a parody too. A lot of love poetry uh, at this time, it's a, a popular genre is called the obad, the morning song, where the sun rises and reveals lovers in their beds, and they curse the sun for rising because it's interrupting the, the wonders of the night before. Here the sun is coming up at noon. It's the middle of the day, uh, not famous as a wooing time. So right off the bat, Shakespeare is telling us uh, we've, we've got this mismatched couple, this innocent young man, this experienced lovesick woman, and it's set at noon. So this is not going to be a conventional love poem. Uh, the second stanza below is where Eve starts making her move, or Eve, oh my God, I thought I was doing Milton for a second, where Venus starts making her move. She says, and a lot of this poem is, uh, is actually monologues by Venus and some dialogue between Venus and Adonis. Venus says, vouchsafe thou wonder to alight thy steed and rein his proud head to the saddle bow. If thou wilt, wilt deign this favor, for thy need a thousand honey secrets shalt you know. Here and come, and sit where never serpent hisses, and being sat, I'll smother thee with kisses. Uh, so she's, actually, she's asking this young man, if you stop your horse and sit down next to me, if you'll do this for me, I'll give you kisses. I'll make it worth your while. So this is her opening gambit, right? Because she's... Uh, I guess very early on here, 13 lines in the poem, confident of her skills and reputation uh, as, as a lover. So what man could possibly turn down his offer? Next slide, please. Well, Adonis is that man. And he seems reluctant. So Venus is going to take matters in her own hands in these two stanzas. So with this, with her dialogue, she sweets, she sees it on his sweating palm. I sweating possibly because it's hot, sweating because he is nervous. Uh, the precedent of pith and livelihood and trembling in her passion calls it bomb, right? She sees she's, she, he's sweating and it attracts her even more to him. Uh, Earth sovereign solve to do a goddess good. So we get four lines on perspiration there. Uh, 
being so enraged, desire doth lend her force courageously to pluck him from his horse. So she is so ravaged in love that she pulls this kid, she takes his sweaty hand and pulls him off the horse. And over one arm, the lusty coursers reign. She puts one arm around the horse. The other was the tender boy. So she's holding both of them. The boy who blushed and pouted in a dull disdain with leaden appetite, unapt to toy. She is red and hot as coals of glowing fire. He red for shame, but frosty in desire. So despite her pickup lines and her taking his sweaty hand and pulling her off the horse, he's not into it. He treats her with a dull disdain. He's not into this. Unapt to toy. Uh, Adonis doesn't seem like somebody who has much of a sense of humor. And the final couplet of that stanza sets the, the tension here. She is full of desire and love and wants to share that. He is shameful and feels no passion at all. This woman is bothering him while he is trying to hunt. Now, it's worth pausing for a second to think about what Shakespeare is doing with, with Venus in here. If we go to the next slide. Uh, this is a very, a very famous issue of Botticelli's birth of, of Venus. Now, I, I don't think Shakespeare actually saw this picture, but it gives us a good uh, prece of how Venus was often popularly Im imagined, right? She's fair and gorgeous with wild hair, right? The, the, the epitome of beauty, right? Uh, so this, this is the sort of, this model of Venus, how could Adonis possibly be reluctant to, to do? So it emphasizes her beauty here. But there's another kind of Renaissance modeling of Venus. And can we go to the next, the next slide? Uh, and the example I have here is Titian. And this is the one he's going for, where she is, uh, you know, oddly masculine and strong and Shakespeare emphasizes this when she talks about him, about her controlling uh, Adonis and his horse at this, the same time. So this is not the fair feminine Venus of Botticelli. This is a kind of frightening, aggressive, you know, oddly masculine Venus. So just a running thread through this is why, do, why does Shakespeare choose this model of Venus to, to emphasize, this kind of threatening Venus? Uh, and, you know, I, I don't have pictures for Adonis a, a here, but that's another question we will go through as we look at Adonis and try to measure his reactions, what, what Shakespeare is uh, saying about both of his lead characters here. Uh, so can we go to the next slide? So this is our Venus. Now, despite her being strong and at least confident early on, Shakespeare gives her a bit of, of depth and allows her to uh, show some inner turmoil. And I think to some degree, she, she displays some self-doubt here. Uh, the, the first stanza, right? The tender spring upon thy tempting lift shows the unripe. Uh, the, the, the sweat on your brow shows that you are indeed young and, and innocent, uh, unripe young. Uh, yet mayest thou well be tested, but you're not too young. Uh, so she's going to give him advice. Make use of time. Let not advantage slip. Beauty within itself should not be wasted. Fair flowers that are not gathered in their time, in their prime, rot and consume themselves in little time. And you recognize that final couplet from one of the manuscripts we looked at earlier. But this is where Venus is going to take on this role of an educator. She realizes that Adonis's reluctance, maybe because he is young and unlearned, and she is exactly not that. So she is going to try to teach him the ways of love. And she, her first argument here is, you're young, you're beautiful, but like flowers decline, uh, your beauty will fade as, as well. 
So don't waste your beauty. And by don't waste your beauty, I mean, get with me in the forest here. Stop, stop being reluctant. And just a, a reminder, uh, for I think the first 700 lines of this poem, Venus essentially has Adonis in a headlock. He's, he's pinning him down. So even though this is kind of the, the measured argument of an educator, uh, she is physically dominating him. Uh, it's a, a funny image. So the first, bit, the, the first bit is Venus as an educator, as the experienced person bringing a novice, a novice into the realm of love. But it's the second part that shows some of her own self-securities, I think, uh, by building on that image of beauty being wasted and, flower, and uh, flowers rotting in the first stanza. The second one, were I hard favored, foul, or wrinkled old, ill-nurtured, crooked, churlish, harsh in voice, or worn, despised, rheumatic, and cold, thick-sided, barren, lean, and lacking juice, then mightest thou pause, for then I were not for thee, but having no defects, why thus and for me? So she spends four lines listing uh, a lot of unattractive, mostly physical qualities of people, right? If, 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 I, if I looked horrible and had a gravelly voice and, and uh, you know, looked broken down, I could see where you wouldn't want to be with me, but I am not. So why are you? So I think at once, this is, this is part of her argument, right? That, that beauty should kind of uh, preserve itself to remain beautiful. But I think, you know, she's also worrying that, you know, maybe these are kind of qualities in me right now. So I'm gonna have to work really hard to convince this guy. Um, this idea of the need to reproduce beautiful things lest they fade is something that energizes Shakespeare's sonnets as well, if you, if you go to that, especially the, the first sonnet makes the argument. It's the speaker of the sonnets making an argument to a young man that he's so beautiful, so he has to have a child who will carry on his beauty. Venus is doing something similar, so it, this demonstrates that there is a concern with reproducing and maintaining beauty uh, throughout Shakespeare's works. Now, next slide. Uh, the, the, a big part of this poem is that Shake, uh, Venus, as the experienced person, as the educator, is going to make a variety of appeals to Adonis to uh, give up his reluctance and, and be with her, right? First, she, she, she tries to physically uh, use, use him and convince her of his charms. Uh, she'll later next tell a story about her relationship with Mars and how she seduced him, uh, trying to get him attracted to her by telling of her liaison with the, the god Mars. Uh, later, he's uh, a, a bit of the part that I, I read. Uh, she makes the argument that Adonis is beautiful. Uh, to maintain beauty, you need to share your beauty. So share it with me. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, Venus will get a, a aggressive. She will, uh, you know, point point blank ask why why are you afraid of me? And then she'll go into the dirty talk, and we'll we'll see this a little bit later. The fifth seduction. There is a side story here where we see that that Venus has taken Adonis off his horse. His horse is unbuckled to anything. Uh, a female horse comes by, and Adonis's horse chases that female horse, and they run off, and Adonis loses his horse. And Venus turns this into a teaching moment. Do you see that two horses attracted to each other ran off together? That's what we should do. That doesn't work. Uh, so she makes another appeal to his, his physical senses to try to inflame love in him. That doesn't work. Uh, she then pulls the old gag where she pretends to faint and asks, oh, only a kiss will revive me. And Adonis kisses her and she you know, tries to reel him in for more and he gets really upset with that. And then, yes, you can leave me, but give me one more kiss. And she tries to play it again. So that's, her please get increasingly desperate. She makes one more final appeal. Uh, apparently, 
This begins at noon, but it ends later in the evening and with the night encroaching, she tries to convince him that night will inspire his love. It doesn't work. So this is a, a lot of this poem. It's the various strategies that Venus uses to try to get Adonis to, to be with him. So, uh, you know, a couple of ways we can see Venus. She is clever and wily and uh, she can improvise and she can come up with persuasive arguments. But on the other hand, it's kind of scary, maybe, that she just won't let this poor boy alone. So this is uh, both of the, the plot action. And to, to go back into some uh, other aspects of the poem, and we can go to the, the next slide. So this is the fun bit. Uh, when she decides, I'm just going to talk dirty to this kid and uh, see if that'll turn him on. So, foundling, she saith, since I have hemmed thee here within the circuit of this ivory pail, since I have you pinned down in this open field, I'll be a park and you shall be my dear. Feed where thou wilt on mountain or in dale, graze on my lips, and if those hills be dry, stray lower where the pleasant fountains lie. Won't go into detail about that, except to say that the deer pun, D-E-E-R, asking him to be a deer, this is something very common in early modern poetry because D-E-E-R slash D-E-A-R, the deer, the animal in the forest, the deer beloved are often complained. A reluctant lover is often compared to a deer uh, running away in the field with the lover being unable to, to capture him. Uh, here she's taking that in another direction by imagining him as a literal deer, the animal, encouraging to be her deer, D-E-A-R, and graze upon her where she will be uh, a park. Um, and uh, it goes on, within this limit is relief enough, sweet bottom grass and high delightful plain, round rising hillocks, bricks obscure and rough. And you can, she's describing the contours of the field like she's describing the contours of her body here, right? To shelter thee from tempest and rain, be my dear since I am such a park, no dog shall rouse thee though a thousand bark. So this is the part that readers in Shakespeare's time really liked, and you'll find this in a bunch of manuscripts, and I, I believe you'll find other printed allusions to it. Uh, you know, what, whatever high-minded philosophy we find in this, this is what Venus and Adonis seems to have been kind of famous for, as a quasi-pornographic Ovidian poem. Does it work? Absolutely not. As you see with the final couplet, at this Adonis smiles as in disdain. Nah, that's that's clever. Uh, each cheek, cheek appears a pretty dimple. It's like a fake smile. To, nah, nah, that, that's compelling, Venus, but um, no. Next slide, please. Oops. Yes, OK. Um, so this, this is after that bit where the two horses meet and Adonis's horse runs off with the, the female horse. And he is, of course, not happy. And for pretty much the first time in this poem, we actually hear Adonis. For the most part, it's Venus talking and Adonis uh, looking with disdain or pouting or some other thing. But here we, we have uh, an actual reaction from Adonis. For shame, he cries, let go and let me go. Uh, my day's delight is past, my horse is gone. Uh, I, my, you've interrupted my hunting trip, my day's delight was hunting and now I can't do it anymore. I've lost my horse and tis your fault I am bereft him so. I pray you hence, Leave me here alone, for all my mind, my thought, my busy care is how to get my palfrey from the mare. Uh, I, I can't, I, I sometimes can't help reading Venus lines without, uh, or reading Adonis's lines without whining a little bit. But although he does have legitimate concerns here, right? 
All he wants to do is hunt. And this crazy woman comes up to him, pulls him off his horse. His horse gets free, and then he's lost it now. So he's hunting trip is interrupted. His horse is gone. It is her fault. And all he wants is to be left alone because on his mind is not love, but how he's going to get his horse back. Now, a couple ways to read this. On one hand, Adonis is, is right. right? This, this woman seems to be intimidating and aggressive. On the other hand, you're really more invested in your horse than spending time with, with Venus? Hmm. Hmm. Well, she gives a response. Right? Thus she replies, Thy palfrey, your horse, as he should, welcomes the warm approach of sweet desire. Affection is a coal that must be cooled, else suffered it will set the heart on fire. And here again we have Venus's teacher. She is making a lesson out of this lost horse, right? Just like the, the horse felt desire and acted upon it, just as you should. Because when you feel affection, you feel desire, it's a, it has to be dealt with. A coal that must be killed, it would be cool, right? A heat that must be smothered. Because if you don't smother it, everything is going to be on fire. It'll set the, the heart on fire. So let me help you cool that fire, Adonis. Right? The, the sea hath bounds, but deep desire have none. Uh, therefore, no marvel, O by horse, be gone, right? The, the, there is no end to desire. So you shouldn't be surprised that your horse is, is running off to do its thing. Um, next slide. So Venus is a teacher again. Uh, so what, what is Adonis interested in? And, and we've gotten hints of this, but here uh, at another part of the conversation, he makes it explicit. And he's going to lay his argument out for why he doesn't want to be bothered. I know not love, quoth he, nor will not know it, unless it be a bore, and then I chase it. Tis much to borrow, and I will not owe it. My love to love is love, but to disgrace it. For I have heard it is a life and death, that laughs and weeps and with all but a breath. So first stanza, what does Adonis love? He doesn't know love unless it's hunting a boar. He loves boar hunting. Because all he knows about real love, all he does is disgrace it. I love to disgrace love is a paraphrase of that fourth line. It's the only thing I love about love is mocking it uh, because he has heard Love leads to death. It, it's fun, there's laughing, but then there's weeping, and it's ephemeral, right? like a breath. So Adonis sees love as something uh, that does not have a good end. So he's going to channel his love into boar hunting, which I guess kind of has an end, right? You chase the boar, you catch it, you have boar sandwiches for, for, for weeks. So what does Adonis love? He loves the very masculine pursuit of hunting. And he values this above a relationship with this, this crazy woman. The next stanza, he makes another and slightly different argument. And just uh, Adonis's arguments tend to be kind of scattershot. He goes on. Who wears a garment shapeless and unfinished? Who plucks, the, who plucks the bud before one leaf put forth, right? Who wears clothing before it is completed, before it is ready to be worn? Who picks a flower before it's fully grown? If springing things be any jot diminished, they wither in their prime, prove nothing worse. If you pluck a flower before it has fully bloomed, it's only going to decline, and that's not a, a good thing. And that's Adonis is comparing himself to a young person who, if he has this liaison with Venus, will be plucked before his time and not grow properly. Right. So uh, the, the argument, the first stanza is essentially 
uh, I, I just stayed in love. I just loved war hunting because love between people always ends in disappointment. And the second one is, oh, and I am really young and you're going to hinder my growth. So please leave me alone. So again, Adonis has legitimate arguments here. Though on the other hand, uh, he, he's, well, he seems like kind of a drip. Right, a bit humorless. I just want to hunt boar. I don't want to, you know, talk to you. Um, you know, boar hunting sure seems fun, but you know, there there are other things you can do with your 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 day. Uh, so, and this is how those long those eight seductions eventually end. Venus realizes that she will not get Adonis to bend to his will, and he's going to go off. But I guess this might count as one final plea for him to at least not hunt. And you can go to the next slide, please. So Adonis is resigned to go off boar hunting. And she tells him, right, thou hast been gone, sweet boy, before this. But that thou told me thou wouldst hunt the boar, right? I, I would have let you go if you hadn't told me that you were specifically interested in boar hunting. Be advised, thou knowest not what it is. You don't know what a boar is. And she's going to be the educator again. Uh, with javelin's point, a curlish swine to gore, whose tushes never sheathed, he wetteth still, uh, like to a mortal butcher, bent to kill. And, she's, and Venus has an opening here because Adonis has just taught her how, ta told her how young and naive he is. So Venus will tell him, and Venus seems to spend a lot of her time in the forest, you don't know what boars are really like. They have these sharp, murderous tucks, tusks, and they want to kill you. Compounding that, she describes what the boar looks like, right? On his bow back, he hath a battle set of grisly pikes that ever threat his foes. His eyes like glowworms shine. When he doth fret, his snout digs sepulchers wherever he goes. Being moved, he strikes whatever is in his way, and whom he strikes, his crooked tushes slay, right? So... He, she describes him as an incredibly ugly beast with eyes like loam words and a, and a snout. Snout is a really ugly word, right? It's a foul, ugly beast who wants to kill you. Why would you want to spend your time chasing after a foul, ugly beast that is trying to kill you when you've got Venus, who's pretty good looking, right here? So she's tr trying to, on aesthetic grounds, make him see the error of, of his ways. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, and she continues, uh, alas, he the boar, not esteems that face of mine. The boar doesn't appreciate your beauty, to which love's eyes pay tributary gazes, nor thy soft hands, sweet lips, and crystal eyne, whose full perfection all the world amazes. In other words, the, the boar, being this disgusting beast, doesn't recognize your beauty. But of course I do, but the boar doesn't. So why spend your time chasing a boar? She puts it bluntly at the end of this speech, and I think I have a longer excerpt on your, your handout, but it ends with, I prophesy thy death, my living sorrow, if thou encounter with the boar tomorrow. If you go hunt the boar, you're going to die, uh, which would make her sad. So Venus has been trying. She's been trying to educate Adonis in the art of love. Uh, here, she is trying to educate Adonis in the art of hunting. And she laments that Adonis is underestimating the strength of the boar. And it might end badly for him tomorrow as he, as he goes hunting. Um, next, next slide. This upsets Adonis. And he's going to give his final sermon here. And, uh, and I'm not entirely joking when I say he delivers a sermon. Uh, because 
Nay then, quoth Adon, you will fall again into your idle, overhandled theme. Uh, the kiss I gave you is bestowed in vain, and in vain you strive against the stream. For by this black-faced knight desires foul nurse, your treatise makes me like you worse and worse. Right? Whatever, Venus, you're just going to return to, oh, you're beautiful, and I love you, and you should love beautiful things, right? This overhandled theme, this one idea that you repeat over and over again. And uh, a, how can I put it? A Themes were often used to refer to a, a lesson in a, a sermon, right? Sermons often contain themes. So there, there is, for whatever reason, some religious language in, in this, as, as Adonis is going to give his final dismissal of, of Venus. So the more, and it's nighttime now, so they've been at this for like seven hours, and the more you go on, I like you worse and worse. You're, 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 you're going on and on is, it's not working, Venus. So what have you urged that I cannot reprove? Uh, what have you said that I can't argue against? The path is smooth that leadeth on to danger. I hate not love, but your device in love that lends embracements unto every stranger. You do it for increase, O oh, strange excuse, when reason is the bod to love's excuse. So to unpack this, right, the path is smooth that leads us on to, to danger, right? The easy way is what gets us in trouble. Whether I imagine the immediate trouble of, of being killed by a wild animal, but also moral trouble, right? The, this taking this easy path of just going with this woman I met in the forest leads to the moral rot, the fact that I won't grow as I should, uh, like, the like the flower plucked before his time. And he clarifies, and this kind of contradicts something he said before. He says, I hate not love, but your device in love. Right. Previously, he said, I only like love to disdain love. But here he's saying, I hate not love, but your device in love. But the way you go about love is what I dislike. Um, so it might be, if we're really going to dig into this poem, it might take some work to figure out what Adonis really thinks and what he's just sort of saying to get Venus off her back. But this seems pretty specific. Uh, your device in love, your method of love, that embrace that leads you to embrace every stranger, like right? the fact that you feel you can just jump out of a tree and have your way with me. That's what I don't like. Right? You do it for for increase, for gain, for your profit, and you abuse reason when you use it to justify your filthy lust. So all of this educating you're doing for me. It's, it's uh, reason as the bod to lust, reason as being used for the evil of satiating lust. So this is where Adonis is kind of, this is, you know, I'm going to fall into sin if I get with you. And let me tell you about your sin of lust. Uh, we can go on to the next, the next, this continues, yes. Uh, so, <clears throat> Call it not love, for love to heaven is fled, since sweating lust on earth usurped its name, right? Remember Adonis sweating earlier in this, in this poem, right? He's saying love is something divine, not, not physical and gross and material, right? under whose simple semblance he had fled upon fresh beauty, blotting it with blame. With blame which the hot tyrant stains and soon bereaves as caterpillars do their tender leaves, right? And under the, the semblance of lust, uh, real love has fled and real love has been stained, corrupted uh, with love leaving. So what Adonis feels, or what, I'm sorry, what Venus feels, according to Adonis, is not love, but lust, and lust is corrupting. But somehow, this young, naive, innocent boy has some ideas about what love is. 
he says in the next stanza, love comforteth like sunshine after rain, but lust's effect is tempest after sun. Love's gentle spring doth always fresh remain. Lust's winter comes ere summer be half done. Love surfaces not. Lust, like a glutton, dies. Love is all truth. Lust, full of forged lies. Right? This is really sermony, right? This is what, you know, love, love is a gentle spring uh, rainfall, a gentle spring drizzle, but lust is like a storm in the sun. Uh, lust is a, a fresh, bright spring. Lust is winter, cold, and death, right? Love doesn't waste. Lust is a glutton. Love is truth. Lust is lies. Uh, this is also very similar to some of Shakespeare's sonnets, where uh, the speaker of Shakespeare's sonnets uh, also kind of turns into a preacher about lust. So, you know, is, is Adonis as naive as he posits to be elsewhere in this poem? Or has he learned all of this from Eve's embraces? Or is he just finally, this is what I really feel. I'm tired of this. I'm just telling you, you don't love me. You suffer lust and I'm better than that. Let me, let me hunt my war. So it's, it's again, it's, it's kind of unclear what Adonis kind of preaches, but you know, we have a guy who's interested in only boar hunting and sounds like a, a, a preacher. You know, maybe he's not the most, uh, how can I put it, you know, interesting of, of people, not the, the sort of person you might want to have a beer with or whatnot. That's certainly wrong for Venus. And I think she actually recognizes that. Oh, we got a little more. Uh, next slide, please. So, more I could tell, he says. But more, I dare not say the text is old, the orator too green. He's trying to use his youthfulness again, right? I can say a lot more about lust, but I don't really know about that. Uh, Therefore, I will now away. My face is full of shame. My heart of teen, mine ears, that's your wanton talk attended, do burn themselves for having so offended. Good day to you, ma'am. You've offended my ears. I'm going to hunt the, the, the boar. So... Adonis has tried to turn the tables on Venus by giving her a lesson about love and lust, and he ends it by saying, I'm, I'm, you've, you've offended me. I don't want to do this anymore. Let me hunt my boar. And he goes off. And next slide. Pardon. So in the last part of the poem, Venus stays up worried with Adonis on the hunt, because she's really serious about that prophecy. I don't think she's just running game there, telling him he he shouldn't hunt. She she really thinks that he is going to um, be harmed if he goes after the boar. And so for a, a good portion of the end of the poem, she kind of goes back and forth. Oh, he's going to be fine. Oh, no, he's already dead. Oh, it'll be okay. Oh, I'll never see him again. Uh, but here, eventually, it, it comes to a head when she sees the, the well, the first stanza gives a sense of her, her variable passions is how the poem describes her, her train of emotions. Uh, j- thus stands she in a trembling ecstasy till cheering up her senses all dismayed. She tells them, tis a causeless fantasy and childish error, they are all afraid, uh, bids leave them quaking, bids them fear no more. And with that word, she spied the hunted boar. So just what she kind of gets themself, uh, uh, she gets herself in a place where she thinks, oh, he might be okay. And then coming out of the woods, she sees the boar that they were chasing after. And the second stanza, she describes it, the boar whose frothy mouth, mouth be painted all with red, like milk and blood being mingled both together. A second fear through all her sinews spread, which madly hurries her. She knows not whither. The way she runs, and now she will know further, but back retires to rape the boar for murder. So the boar comes out of the woods, and it's covered in in blood 
and whatever else. And she's just gotten herself to the point where she thinks, uh, I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, she hears the hunting horn, which signals the end of the hunt. And she thinks, oh, it's going to be okay. Then she sees this boar and it's bloody. And she feels fear again. And that, that ugly description of the boar ties back to the description, uh, the ugly description of the boar she told to Adonis. So you can see her prophesizing, I guess. Um, the next slide, we see the boar in all its glory and figure out what he did. She realizes, tis true, tis true, this was Adonis slain. He ran upon the boar with his sharp spear, who would not wet his teeth at him again, and by a kiss sought to persuade him there, and nuzzling his flank, the loving swine sheathed unaware the tusk in his soft groin. So Venus is, she's now realized that Adonis was indeed killed by the boar, and she's imagining how it happens. And she does it through the Venus filter where everything is kind of about love and sexuality, right? The boar, his sharp spear entered Adonis by his groin. The, nor, the boar was just trying to nuzzle him, but he went too far and killed him by accident. And she develops this in that second stanza. Had I been tooth like him, I must confess, with kissing him, I would have killed him first, right? If I had sharp horns on my face when I kissed him, I would have killed him by accident. But he is dead, and never did he bless my youth with his, the more I am accursed. And with this, she falleth in the place she stood and stains her face with his congealed blood. So she has to find a way to... She finds a way to not blame the boar by t by tying it into Adonis's incredible beauty, right? He was just, the boar was just trying to kiss him and it went too far. I would have done the same thing. I, I can't, I, I can't blame him. This is a tragedy. I told him he should have shared his youthful beauty, but he didn't. And now he's dead and she's going to weep uh, in the, the pool of blood that's, that's formed there. So next slide. What does Venus take away from this? Uh, mourning the dead Adonis, she says, since you are dead, lo, here I prophesy, sorrow on love, here ever shall attend. It will be weighted on with jealousy, fine sweet beginning, but unsavory end. Ne'er settled equally, but high or low, that all love's pleasure shall not match his woe. So at this point, she's kind of coming around to the argument that Adonis had made earlier, right? He's the one who said what he's heard of love is that it always ends in some sort of pain. And Venus feels the same way. And so she says, well, I'm the goddess of love. I hereby decree uh, love and sorrow are always going to attend one another. They're always going to be good together. It'll always be Brought, jealousy will always be associated with love. Bad endings will be associated with love. And whatever pleasures one gets out of love, uh, they aren't equivalent to the woe one would feel with it. So it's kind of a despairing turn for Venus at the end of this. But one, one more thing happens that might salvage it. And it's on the next slide. Remember, this is a story based on Ovid's Metamorphosis. And Adonis, having been killed and bleeding over the countryside, is going to make a little change. Uh, by this, he says, the boy that by her side lay killed was melted like a vapor from her sight. And in his blood that on the ground lay spilled, a purple flower sprung up, checkered with white, resembling well his pale cheeks and the blood which in round drops upon their whiteness stood. Right? It's one of those Ovidian miracles, right? To, to be remembered for the young, beautiful man he was, Adonis's disgustingly gored body fades away into the ground and instead a purple flower uh, with white speckles blossoms representing Adonis's beauty. So it, it is preserved, it is translated and maybe, you know, 
offering some hope for Venus that his beauty can be preserved. So fantastic. Great, great ending for Adonis. What does Venus do? She bows her head, the new sprung flower to smell, comparing it to her Adonis's breath, right? The, the, even the scent of the flower reminds her of Adonis and says within her bosom, it shall dwell since he himself is reft from her by death. So you know what? The flower is gonna go with me since his bodily death separated him from me. So I'm gonna bring him back. She crops the stalk, right? She cuts the flower and in the breach appears green dropping sap which she compares to tears. So she plucks this new flower that is the metamorphosized Adonis and the sap is, 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 is tears, is crying. So Venus has got her Adonis after all. And the, the, the next slide, I should say. Uh, Poor flower, quoth she. This was thy father's guise. This is the, the disguise of, of Adonis. Sweet issue of a more sweet selling sire. For every little grief to wet his eyes, to grow into himself was his desire. And so tis thine, but know it as good, whether to wither in my breast as in his, his blood. Well, he always wanted to blossom and mature, and he did as a flower. So now he'll be with me. Uh, she, she actually play, plants the flower in her bosom and says, it's, it's fine, uh, just as good that he dies in my breast as in the field with a, a boar. So kind of at the end of this, in, in a weird way, Venus triumphs, right? She gets her Adonis. It, it might not be the way she wanted, but nevertheless, uh, this, this beautiful man will be with her for his entire life. And that's the, the core of the, po the poem. And I'll go to the, the last slide and, and start wrapping this up. So um, first of all, just a, to a promotion of this, uh, this cartoon at the top, uh, it's a, a, a young Canadian woman named Maya Gosling. She, does a, she has a website called uh, Good Tickle Brain, where she does stick figure Shakespearean cartoon representations of Shakespeare plays. And she's pretty awesome. I have a, a poster of this in my... Uh, office and uh, Venus and Adonis in three panels. This is one of her tricks, right? V Venus really, really wants to sleep with Adonis. Adonis is more interested in going bear hunting. Adonis is bored to death by a boar, and that's yeah, pretty much the poem. Uh, but the big questions that I would like to, that I play around with my classes is, right, how do we think of Venus? Is she a, a pushy, problematic aggressor, right? A, a sexual harasser? Uh, or, you know, the quintessence of love, right? Because love is irrational, emotional, and you do stupid things. And how many Shakespeare plays are about people doing stupid things in love? Is, is Venus just part of that? Um, Adonis, is he indeed that young may victim? Or, you know, did he not learn what he should have? Is, is he just kind of the, the whiny teenager who would have been better off just spending time with Venus rather than going boar hunting, which ends up killing him physically? A third is is the poem as cynical as it as it seems. I mean, Venus seems to come to the conclusion that love will always end in pain. But does that mean it's it's not worth it? Uh, does that the, her plucking of the flower at the end represent a triumph that suggests yeah maybe love is okay after all? Are they just stating an inevitability? Uh, what is this poem trying to say about about love? Beyond that, men and women tend to be stupid when they're in love. And, and finally, just I don't even have an answer for this one. So Shakespeare, the theaters are closed during a plague. He's kind of isolated. So he decides to write an erotic Ovidian poem. Why this subject for that? It seems kind of weird. Uh, I'll just say to, to point off his, his like in the um, preface to Venus and Adonis, he promises uh, Southampton some graver labor. And that turns into a poem called The Priest, which is a tragic poem. Lucrece is assaulted by the Tarquins, kills herself, and the Tarquins are overthrown. And it's about the founding of the Engl of the, uh, the the overthrow of the, Eng the Roman kings. A much more serious poem. Uh, so there we go. So I am going to stop. Uh, at least at least my chatting here. Uh, we have a couple of bits if people want to ask questions. Yes, next next week at the end, uh, we'll talk about Titus Andronicus, which is 
uh, kind of ties into Luke Beast. It's a weird, very strange, very violent, bloody kind of B-movie type Shakespearean play, but but uh, very interesting, I think. Um, but I can hang on for a couple minutes if people want to ask questions or sound off or offer ideas or anything else about Venus and Adonis or anything Shakespeare. Yeah, Okay, uh, if, if anyone has questions, feel free to uh, ask me via, via email, uh, either the, the lifelong learning at wichita.edu. I believe I have my email address on the syllabus or somewhere. I'm always uh, happy to talk about Shakespeare personally. Um, until then, uh, if you have time to look at, at Titus Andronicus next week, that would be Fantastic. It's in every edition of Shakespeare's works, and there are plenty of cheap editions. You can go to Half Price Books or whatever for. And uh, we'll move on and talk about Shakespeare's early theatrical career and revenge tragedy, which is a, a fantastic uh, English genre. Uh, so until then, that's all I have. Thank you very much for your time and patience, and I hope you're all well. Uh,